Industry Connect 2024, driving excellence to disruptive innovation. It is an honor to introduce Mr. Nirodha Gunadasa, a visionary leader in the field of architecture and sustainable design. Nirodha has been driving force behind numerous landmarks, projects, both in Sri Lanka and on the international stage. Nirodha is a prolific practitioner and an academic contributor. He serves as a guest lecturer at the Faculty of Engineering, University of Peradeniya, where he played a pivotal role as the founding member of MSc program in Sustainability Built Environment. His lectures cover critical subjects such as fundamentals of architecture and building economics for sustainable and infrastructure planning for sustainable cities. He is the author of the widely acclaimed book, Parametrism, Bridging Engineering and Architecture, published by Lambert Academy, published in the United Kingdom. This book has been translated into several languages, including French, German, and Italian, reflecting its global influence. As the Vice President of the Council of Tall Building and Urban Habitat, Sri Lankan chapter, Nirodha has actively contributed in the field of high-rise architecture. He has presented his insights at the CTBUH forums in Chicago, Dubai, and Colombo, sharing his expertise on tall building designs and urban habitat. His involvement extends to various organizations such as the Green Building Council of Sri Lanka. He frequently drives guest lectures at the leading academic institutes, including the Faculty of Architecture, University of Moratua. Mr. Nirodha Gunadasa, may I invite you to the stage to share your knowledge? Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, right, okay. Right, so thank you very much for that kind introduction about me. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, disruptive innovations and a design technology. Uh, so as she explained, I am involved in Arc Arcadium and CTBH. In both Arcadium and CTBH, we are uh, doing one thing common, that is uh, we innovate forms of tall buildings. That's what we do. And these are some of the tall buildings we have. Uh, designed actually, these are uh, innovative buildings, uh, disruptive innovations. And uh, some of you have worked with me, I, I think, in many of these projects. These are real projects, and uh, some of the projects are completed now. Uh, so, uh, INSI has thought that we are uh, good to talk about innovations and designs. So, that's why I'm here to talk to you. So, uh, for me, to uh, 20,000 years until 1800s. Uh, these are the things uh, human beings have uh, innovated. A door knock. It's a fantastic idea in, I mean, uh, in a time where you don't have anything to close your doors uh, to innovate this kind of thing. So you can make it uh, close your thing and then go. Arrows. Swords. We have our scissors. So these are innovations done at 1800s and before that. And uh, in Thailand and Sri Lanka, the coconut grinders. Bulokka is a, a great innovation like that. So in the time you have, you have, you have to carry things by yourself to innovate a weed and then to put a bullock there and then you can carry it without any effort. Great innovations. A needle is a good innovation and candle is a good innovation. And what is this? Uh, this is called a catapult, so where yeah, you can put some stones there and destroy ships kind of things. So these are actually, uh, what I say, is the best of human possible innovations we see uh, uh, for last 20,000 years. So after 1800 onwards, for last uh, 200 years, uh, what are the kind of innovations we see from people? This is steam engines to diesel engines to petrol engines to jet engines to rocket boosters. We see aeroplanes to fighter jets to rockets to uh, space shuttles to space stations. 
and we see uh, cannon guns to machine guns to uh, war tanks to missiles to nuclear bombs. We see uh, the telescopes to uh, radio telescopes to this is uh, Hubble telescope to James Webb telescope to uh, space probes. We see uh, normal uh, what is called uh, filament bulbs to uh, the candescent bulbs to uh, the mercury bulbs to the LED bulbs to uh, xenon bulbs to then laser toys. And we see MRI scanners to stents to uh, then uh, bionic limbs to bionic eyes to antibiotics. We see calculators to uh, chips to then supercomputers to quantum computers to uh, then robotic counts to entire humanoid robots. So we see uh, on, on, I mean, a plethora of uh, innovations and designs happen. Uh, in 200 years, that has never happened for the history of 20,000 years. So these innovations and designs, I say, are humanly impossible. So we are just apes. We have just uh, uh, evolved for 200,000 years. And how can this be possible to be done by people like us? So the thing is, we have to understand what power this design revolution we are facing. We have seen. To do that, we will first look at the ancient ancient design technology. Okay, so uh, nearly 2,000 years until 1800s, uh, there was a slow progress in design technology. It is because there wasn't a design technology as such. So let's say this this is a castle. And then you have to uh, design a caterpillar to destroy that castle. So how are you going to do this? Uh, it's 100 meters away from the caterpillar and you have to throw 100 kilograms stone to destroy it. Uh, so how to do that? So there wasn't a way, only way is uh, you can just uh, do it by experiment. You can build one and then see whether it is working or if you have experience building such ones, then use your experience and do it. So that was the design methodology that was there. But uh, after 1800s, actually after 1600s onwards, with the influence of Galileo and Newton's, people understood one very important thing. That is the world, I'll say classical world. World works on simple mathematical principles. So that is what uh, ch changed the world actually. So, uh, there's a principle of falling alcohols, it's safety equals safety. And it is the same principle when you roll a barrel along the floor. There's no different principle. And uh, amazing, it's the same principle, all these panels are orbiting the sun. There's no different principle. It's the same principle, blood flows in my body, uh, uh, waterfall works, so all, all works under simple one principle. So this is a screenshot. Uh, and this is a stone of uh, M mass. And I'll drag this into X distance. And uh, the force I have applied, I can consider it's a uniform force, it's F. So the work you have to do by dragging this, so the energy you are storing here is the force times the distance Fx. So simple. And uh, this stone goes up. And the I say it's small as the distance goes up. And then the work done or the energy that uh, goes is the force weight of this m times the gravity, the distance, the same thing, fx kind of thing. So it is m d times small s. These are the same thing. Fx equals m d times small s. That explains everything about it. So if you want to Identify what is the distance you have to drag this in order to throw this uh, stone to a certain height. Use this, you can help me. And if you are designing a slingshot like this, if you want to know what is the force, what is the size of the band, whether you have to do a, a stronger band or a, a weaker band, you can calculate what the is using this. And if you are using a heavier stone than a lighter stone, what is the height you need to go? You can calculate this. So it's so simple. So inventors, those who invent things, can now calculate things and quantify things. 
So that is uh, one thing that brought this change to the world. And then uh, I call this small legs because uh, this was only when that this small legs is a small height, like the height of a mango tree kind of a thing. But if it is a distance from uh, Earth to Moon kind of a thing, it doesn't work well. Because this gravity changes as actually with the polar height, gravity is going to go down. Then you can use this simple equation. So it only if it is the height of the mango tree, uh, it works. So if I go to throw a stone upward, never to return to Earth, to go forever, what is the amount of energy I have to put in? I'll draw this diagram it's easy to understand. And this is the center of the this is Earth, and the radius of what this is the surface of the Earth, and that is infinity. And I've taken the distance from the center of the Earth to this one, x. Uh, the gravity is a simple thing, it works uh, as you move away from the earth, the gravity reduces. So, this is a relationship. Gravity, this is a constant, is proportionately related to expand downstairs. So, this is what uh, uh, Leibniz and Newton uh, came out with this brilliant idea of calculus. When things are changing, like the gravity changes, we don't have any further any problems of calculating because. We have calculus. So this uh, planet is moving around the sun. So when it is near here, you have a higher gravitational force. We have a very less gravitational force here. And when it is somewhere there, you have a different force and the, at a different direction. But still, we don't have any problem calculating its trajectory, the force, the velocity of this planet. Everything can be calculated because we have the calculus to calculate. Things that are very things that are changing. So, for instance, this example it is very easy now. Uh, the force acting on this at x distance is mg, which is this. So, if I move this to a small distance, like the height of a mango tree, this works. We can just multiply mg by small x, we get an angle. So what calculus does is we add them from starting from the surface of the world to the infinity all these small mango trees here and we get the total amount of energy. So that's what the calculus does and that changes many things. This is actually enough even for you to design a rocket to go to the moon. So earlier when you don't know what is the amount of energy, what, what is the number is, how big this is or not. People might have tried with the string shots, bigger ones and bigger ones, you don't know. But we know now with this number, a string shot don't, doesn't work, a catapult doesn't work, even a, a super speed jet doesn't work. To deliver a small payload like that, we need uh, this rocket plus three rocket boosters and everything. It is possible to do that design, it is because uh, this way of thinking becomes an innovator. So now, uh, inventors can calculate and quantify many classical systems. So I use the word classical. Uh, I'll explain why I call it classical. So for, for example, pendulum hanging and then swinging. If you know the weight of the pendulum and the distance, you can exactly calculate the one second timing. Swing shot you can design with that. When you're designing a dam, you know the pressure at the top of the dam, you know the water pressure at the bottom of the dam. Everything can be calculated uh, with this system. And if you are designing a shock absorber, same thing. And if you are designing a air balloon, if you know the weight you have to carry, and if you know the temperature of the air, you can calculate the volume of the balloon you require. So everything can be calculated uh, and done. And I say classical, what does classical mean? Classical means uh, this works only for the things of scale of our body size and uh, the scale of the solar system. Beyond that, it doesn't work. So, for example, things uh, moving at close to the velocity of light, it doesn't work. And for quantum things, uh, atoms and molecules, uh, F equals M kind of things doesn't work. So, we need something else. And that's what this monster's equation do, it looks really interesting, don't worry. 
but uh, we can prove it means nothing else but it equals mv in the classical thing it's a very general thing but we we'll try to understand what this means uh, in in a, in a little uh, simple way there's a thing called q so far here it means a coordinate system so it's simply x y z but it is more general so if you want to use uh, polar coordinates or parabolic coordinates it's uh, so general equation but for our purposes we just uh, forget everything and we we'll say it's x everybody knows x it's the direction and uh, here we have a q so far dot thing that means the time derivative of that so for us the time derivative of uh, x you know it is uh, the velocity so this side we are talking about uh, scripted l uh, how this l thing changes when velocity changes here we are talking about this scripted l we come to that when x changes and of course the time derivative so this is equal to that that's what uh, this equation says and this is a very very important pivotal equation uh, in terms of innovation so you see why and what is this uh, scripted l thing it is called lugrange and it is the thing that changed our entire world I'll come to that and uh, in classical mechanics it is the difference between kinetic energy and the potential energy uh, if you look at relativity it's the space time interval x square minus t square square root in quantum mechanics it means different different things uh, but it is called a Lagrange we we'll remember that name Lagrange so Lagrange so it is important because all kind of physical systems, quantum mechanics, let it be, let it be relativity, all kind of physical systems can be described with this Lagrange. So the change we see from F equals N to calculus, now we see from calculus to all the systems uh, that are happening in the world. So it can describe waves, it can describe electromagnetism, electrodynamics, uh, entire quantum mechanics are based on Lagrangians. Then uh, we have the standard modular particles. Okay, I think uh, most of you know the standard modular particles. I will say this is the greatest discovery of mankind. The standard model. Uh, we have about uh, 16, 17, uh, uh, what is called atoms here, uh, particles here, uh, and then. Uh, Entire world, everything happening can be described with this thing. For example, this is this U and V is up and down quarks, and with blue, we create two blue ones plus uh, uh, a down quark, it's a photon, and then two down quarks or up quarks, it's a uh, neutron. So, if neutrons, elect neutrons, photons, and electrons make the entire world we live in, we know uh, all the elements of hydrogen, helium, lithium. Uh, is made out of this. So this explains everything and only particle we need to describe the world we live in is light photon. So with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 particles, this model can explain everything happening in this world. And uh, the most people in the most people doesn't know is this is a commercial uh, marketing way of describing uh, the standard model. The standard model is not that. The standard model is just a Lagrangian. This Lagrangian fills out uh, one A4 sheet kind of thing. It's a small document, and this is the standard Lagrangian. This explains every phenomena that is known to mankind. If you ask why water is wet. This can calculate and explain why water is wet. And if you ask what is the boiling temperature of lead or iron or whatever it is, the answer is here. You can precisely calculate these things. And energy released by any nuclear explosion, you can calculate. And if you ask even how long the sun will last, when the sun will die, this can explain. So, what is the result for designers and the innovators for this? So, this is the root of a plethora of large scale innovations we see in the world. The quantum computing is possible because of the standard model, and the innovation of microchips you are talking about is because of this. And we have nuclear fission uh, reactions and the nuclear bombs calculated based on standard model. And we have uh, nowadays, uh, you see this uh, micro level, uh, what is called. 
uh, scans and then these kind of uh, things is possible in the sta standard model. We have the nuclear reactors like this, we have carbon nanotubes kind of technologies, we have nuclear fusion reactors now thinking, talking about, all that is calculated and done based on the standard model. And we have, uh, these are uh, superconductors, and because of superconductors, we have uh, CAT scanners and then we have maglev maglev frames. All that is possible because of the standard model. Right, so all that I call pencil and paper mathematics because all these calculations you are doing from computer in practical situation. But if you want, you can take a pencil and paper and do all these calculations uh, and then uh, work, work out things. So, like uh, in William Hanging and then how it's going to be you can calculate. So, two body problem. You have two celestial bodies, how they move, you can calculate to the system. And even uh, when it comes to black holes, at least up to the green polarization, you can calculate what is happening there. But there are things you can't calculate in the system. For instance, three body problem. So three celestial bodies moving under their own gravity, how they will behave, you can't calculate it because it is so complicated. Two pendulums, double pendulum, you have one pendulum and another pendulum when you hang on to that one and when you release it, this is the kind of trajectory. And uh, we can't calculate it in this system, it's, it's so complicated. These are two uh, black holes colliding each other, so those, that is also very complicated thing, you can't do it. So we can't do it out of pencil and paper, but today we can do it. And I uh, think most of the engineers know how they do it. It is called numerical integration. You can do it only with computers. So how you do it? If you know the position of these three bodies and the velocities, we can calculate a, a, a very small amount of time. Next moment, what is happening? Based on that, what is happening next moment? So moment after moment after moment, we can build up this trajectory. So that is a new thing, numerical integration. So that is what changed the world. That is what brought this kind of a factor of innovations to the world. And that is the basis. And the idea is, we have a discussed base. We are now we as we are in this. What have we done with this modern innovation technology? Uh, and so forth. So when I, when I talk to many engineers, this is what uh, they have told me. Uh, I have spent my entire life, uh, campus life on calculus, and now I don't know what the hell to do with it. <laughs> so that's what I hear from many of the engineers. The thing is, uh, in the university they are taught, they are given the magic wand to their hand. And the uh, thing is that teachers have forgotten to tell them the magic spell. So they don't know how to use this. And they don't know whether to this and then keep memos. That such has happened. So they were not told that children, these are the greatest power of the universe that we are bringing into your hand. You can conquer the moon with it. So it is not told to them. So that is the problem I think we have in our country. So, as a nation, as I think uh, the, in the Professor Halvatova's lecture for the study showed, that as, as a nation we have failed to innovate with modern design technology. So, that is uh, what we see. And uh, even if we see those patients, patients he show, people have done chiral and error method. So, that's why it's very slow. So, this uh, modern design technology has not gone into the innovations. Right, so how to use it? So I think most of you are, uh, I think, professionals here, so I will show how I do it. So that is the, I think that will be the most important thing here. So I'm going to dem demonstrate here and then show how it is to be done. And I'm going to demonstrate how we can do wonders with the modern design technology. Uh, I'll try my best to do it, uh, to show. So I'll explain uh, it uh, like this. Uh, this is an innovation. What you see here is an innovation. And it is actually the greatest innovation ever. 
if you look at this innovation closely, uh, it has a sensory system down here. It has a power supply system. It has a uh, mobility system, and also it has a reproductor system. If you take this and put it on a wall and wait for, let's say, 10 million years, it takes form out of the context and change into something like this. If you take it and put it in water and wait for 10 million years, it becomes something like that. And if you put it in ground, it becomes something like this. You can see everything is there, the sensory system is there, the same place, the power supply system is there, the mobility system is there and also reproductive system, everything is there, to the same, same design. And when you put it in the sky, you see something like this. You can see there's no different designs for water one design, for land one design, for sky one design. It's one single design. And how it adapts it, it's changed proportions, it's changed parameters and it takes different forms. And that is the kind of innovation even we do today uh, as architects, most probably. This is the modern innovation technology. This is how we design things today. So I'll show you how to create such innovations. It's not that difficult. So it's all about understanding relationships and modeling relationships. Because uh, you need not to do rigorous calculations today. All that is done by computers. But your duty is, as innovators, is to identify relationships and the model those relationships. I'll show how to do it. This is a sun. It's massive. Then this is a satellite. Uh, its position and everything is given. And uh, your task is to design the trajectory of the satellite. So let's say we are going to design the trajectory of the satellite. And uh, we are allowed to play with the mass of the sun. We can reduce it as we want. We can increase the mass of the sun as we want. And uh, innovate the best trajectory for the satellite. So that is our task. So how to do this kind of a design, this kind of an innovation. So first thing when we are given a design task like this or innovation task is we set up the playground to play with. So that is what we do. Actually, that is the only thing we have to do now. So we'll identify the things that predominantly govern the trajectory of the satellite. I, I think we talked about this. This people is one thing, the force between uh, these two. And the Newton's law of gravity of people is the mass, simple M is the mass of the satellite, capital M is the mass of sun, the divided by R squared. We talked about it earlier. So these are the two governing equations. That's so. So F equals M, F equals this, and uh, the same force we are talking about. So when you put them together, the mass of the satellite and also, we get a simple mass equation, A equals M square, M divided by R square. And this sufficiently explains how this works. And this covers the form of the trajectory of this satellite. So it's that simple. And designing this trajectory is all about gauging this relationship, modeling this relationship. Computers can do it for you, so you can model this as a vector field. Uh, I'm not going to show that. And now, after you modeling it, when you change the mass of the sun, the trajectory takes different form. You can see in your eyes on, on, on computer when you model this. So different uh, conditions of gravity in different forms. So when, when it is so high, uh, this satellite is spiraling into the sun. If it is a certain number, it will be a circle. And if it is a uh, little uh, weaker, it will be an ellipse. And if it is even weaker, it will be a parabola right there. So it changes uh, as the gravity changes. So you can play with it now. It is the same thing like this. I mean, even this feature. Uh, when, when gravity is high, uh, it takes a form like this. And what is this? Gravity. So, reducing gravity or reducing the scale is mathematically the same thing. So, when the gravity is low, it, it will be like this. When gravity is even low, it will be like this. So, if you suddenly increase the gravity, uh, this elephant will not be able to get up with the legs. 
And we have experiment this is even uh, buildings we have modeled the same way. Uh, so this is a building that acts on gravity. So when gravity is low, the building takes its form. As you increase in the term due to the gravity, it changes the form and it becomes something like this. But uh, one thing is, until recent times, complicated design solutions are out of this system. So we can't design complicated things out of this. Gravity is something simple, simple but uh, uh, when it comes to a project like uh, designing a building, gravity is not the only thing governing the thing. So we have the land, where it's a parameter, we have climate, the land form, budget, even culture is a parameter that governs the form of the building. So. There are a lot of parameters. So if you try to write an equation connecting all these things, it will be a very complicated equation. Isn't it? So right now uh, we have a solution for that. For example, Richard Feynman found uh, this solution when, when the electrodynamics are so complicated. Instead of uh, writing equations, he started drawing di diagrams. So when things are so complicated, what we do is instead of writing equations, we draw diagrams. And uh, this is how uh, today we done with visual programming languages. Uh, so this uh, is not usual program language. So I think most of the artists use that, and the engineers use that, visual programming language. So each of these box is a mathematical equation. We can put it into several, with several. For example, we can put numbers, we can put vectors, we can put fields. Uh, and you can put geometries and the, uh, the equation do each processing and takes out an answer. That answer you can give it to another equation. So likewise you can just connect wires and do this wiring diagram and play with it and come up with uh, a complicated thing and then come up with a different solution. So that is what visual programming languages are doing and they are very popular these days. And they form the basis of what we call parametric design. So for example, this is a real project we are started, we have started in Colombo Port City. Uh, so you can see as the height of this building is now a parameter on so I can just adjust the height in a slider and it uh, goes up and comes down. It's not just acting uh, to the height, you can see as the height increases, the ground floor lobbies, its basic requirement changes. So it automatically reacts and then all these things are automatically adjusted. Everything is connected. So this building is not just now uh, wagging in the wind, you can see as it increases, some windows appear and they disappear. That is as the probe rate increases, you have the requirement of light and ventilation and it responds to that and then all these are uh, designed such a way. This is the same building uh, when we change the climate parameter. So when it is in a colder climate, you don't need that much of windows it wishes. When you put it into a tropical climate, you need a lot of shading devices, overhangs, and a lot of openings. So it responds to the climate and then hand falls. So like this feature, when the proportions change, when the parameters change, uh, the form changes and it becomes something else. And that is how uh, we innovate things today. And then uh, that's it. So what we do is we set up the ground to play with this parameter, this is number one. And then playing the game and innovate solution is, this is the easy task. So this is the final form of the innovation we have done for that project. And there are several other projects we have done. So this is a global event in Abu Dhabi. You can see the kind of, the sun, how we have played with the sunlight, how we have played with the public space in that particular climate. Uh, this kind of innovation is difficult to do uh, just with our mind and paper. So this is done with this, uh, this called uh, new uh, design technology or innovation technology. So this is uh, part of the Node 3 or the visual program uh, language thing we have done for that particular project. It's only a small part, so it's, it's not a long uh, This is a sketch uh, we started actually two weeks ago. Uh, it's a house of 54 Bahrain. Uh, it's, a, it's a sports complex, so we are now working on this project, the same thing. And then this is uh, Enrica Kalani, and she talked about it earlier. 
So uh, in this project, uh, the challenge is uh, the east is here, so building is facing east and west. And uh, we need a lot of direct sunlight. We have to see direct sunlight into the building. We want people to have views to east and west, but still we don't want direct sunlight falling into the building. So we have given an innovative form to the building. This was modeled with this technology. And then uh, we incorporated greenery to this thing in such a way it resembles a mountain kind of a thing. Uh, and all that is uh, thanks to this uh, innovative design technology. And this kind of a thing is humanly impossible uh, without uh, the modern design technology. Right, so for last 200 years, that was the uh, design technology we had, and uh, there hasn't been much of a change for 200 years. The thing is, world work, works on mathematical relationships. That is the number one thing, and they can be dealt with differential equations. That's what we see. And for the last 20 years, we see something a little bit more adding to that. That is numerical integration and this parametric design things. But it's not much of a change. So we can deal with many things, but actually there are things we still can't do, human can't do. For example, uh, we fail to deal with much complicated systems like animal brains, and then about uh, the climate crisis we are facing now. We don't have a solution because we fully don't understand how climate works. It's a complicated system. But the news is uh, within the next two years. I'll say next two years, there might be a massive change in the design innovation technology. So there has been a radical change in 200 years that we can't imagine for 20,000 years. And similar kind of change might happen in two years time. That these 200 years innovations are just nothing when you see what is going to happen in two years. It might happen. There is going to be a revolution of innovation technology. What are the revolutions you have heard of? You might say industrial revolution. So if you think industrial revolution is a revolution, artificial intelligence is not going to be a revolution. Artificial intelligence is an explosion in relation to industrial revolution. Because technology uh, has been growing, not fast, but exponentially. The problem with human mind is we we can't imagine exponential growth. Our minds are set up to think only linear growth. To demonstrate that, I'll, I'm always showing this example. This is 0.1 millimeter thick paper. You take this 0.1 millimeter thick paper, fold it once. The thickness is 0.2 millimeters now. If you fold it again. Thickness is becomes 0.4 millimeters. The question is, if you fold this 42 times, what is the thickness of this paper going to be? Do you believe if I say it is going to be taller than me? If you fold it 42 times, it will be taller than me. Does anybody believe that? I think nobody can. What if I told you if I fold this 42 times, it will go and hit the moon? Do you believe? Nobody is giving it, isn't it? But you have calculators now on your pocket, isn't it? In your phones, just do it. The calculation is 0.1 millimeter into 2 to the power 42. The answer is 450,000 kilometers. The distance from Earth to Moon is only 300,000 kilometers. We can't imagine it because at each fold, the height is growing exponentially. So that is the same thing with technology. The technology has been growing always exponentially and we can't imagine where it is being now. The person who first noticed it is uh, Ray Costell and around year 2000 he said right now the processing power on average computer is like an insect. Right? It's like a cockroach is doing. But he said in, in very very few times it is going to be equal to a train of a mouse and by he said 2030. This era is going to be equal to human brain, and there will be a uh, drastic improvement happening beyond that. So, this is a better graph explaining that. This line shows the human intelligence, and the important thing is also growing. 
is also growing. But the headlines of the artificial intelligence and uh, by 2030, it will cross the line. Uh, average processing power of a computer will become equal to a human brain, and that is called artificial general intelligence. And uh, according to this model, 2045, something important will happen. That means uh, all the human brains get together will be less than an average computer's processing power. And during this period, something important will happen. Now look at, as human beings, we have created a machine that is smarter than us. Can that machine create a machine smarter than itself? If it cannot, how can it be in the first place be smarter than us? So it will surely be able to do that. And there will be smarter machines, created by smarter machines. And this huge process will continue. And that's why we say there will be an intelligence explosion beyond that. And uh, by 2100, it will consume all matter and energy in the universe according to the model. And the entire universe is going to be one big human machine. So that is this, this model. Uh, I don't believe it's true. Nobody believes, but that is the only uh, model that has worked, that has shown uh, the correct progress so far. And today we are at the verge of artificial general intelligence. That is a fact. And uh, most of us don't know what artificial intelligence is properly. So let's try to talk about it as well. So I show this graphic. This is Gary Kasparov when he went to school in year 5, I suppose. Uh, he was defeated by the computer, the world is champion. Uh, the thing is, does this have anything to do with artificial intelligence? Does it? It doesn't have anything to do with artificial intelligence. Because this is a machine defeating intelligence. It has nothing to do with AI, this computer or machine defeating uh, intelligence. What is artificial intelligence then? This is a better wording. Artificial intelligence is all about digital brains living inside large computers. Large computers. So when I say large computer, it's not laptops kind of things. Large computer is a large, this is a large computer. So they fill up several warehouses and they consume power more than sometimes one power station. They are huge things. So tra traditionally, the seat of intelligence of animals has always been their biological brain. Uh, and therefore, the seat of intelligence of artificial intelligence has to be an artificial brain. So whether it is artificial brain or, 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 or natural brain, there's a building block for brains. That is Brains are made out of neurons. So if you understand what a neuron is, you understand what artificial intelligence is. So in this uh, thing, I'm going to do that uh, demo thing, I'm going to explain what a neuron is. <laughs> this is a father. His height is X. This is mother, her height is Y. And we are going to do a, a, a neuron to calculate the height of their son. So we think there is a relationship, we are going to calculate how tall their son is. How to do it? We take x and we multiply it by the number. I'll call it w1 and then we'll multiply y by w1. We put it to an equation. We will say the equation is for the sake of simplicity x plus y. And we get an answer. This setup is simply a neuron. So let's think uh, height of father is 1 meter, right? Height of mother is 1 meter. This W1 and W2, I don't know, I have to calculate it. To begin with, I'll add 1 there and 1 here. So we get an answer. The answer is 2. So once we get the answer, what we do is we know their son's height. Here he is. This is their son. His height is not 2, his height is 1. So there is an error of 1. So what we do is, we send this error back to this equation and calculate what is W1 and W2. With one family you will not be able to do it, but if you have the data of 
many families, if you send it to here and then send it back home, keep on doing that, you will be able to arrive at uh, a relatively good answer to calculate After that, you can take this and then uh, use it to calculate when you marry someone or if they look at the height of their son, they look at Right. And this sending it through is called the back propagation, and it is also called training or learning of uh, the list of it means. Uh, only thing is for this kind of thing, one is at the same time, not a single one, but a network of networks. And uh, I represent the neural network uh, in a trapezium like this. So you know input is here, output is there. The neural networks can do many things. For example, people have tried uh, sending the sounds made by waves to neural networks, and now they understand what these waves are talking about. Little bit they understand. And they have sent to the sounds of bats talking and then send it through this and they understand at least now these bats have they are personal names so they have uh, uh, this is human genome and uh, we have documented it it's there but there is no single man on earth who can look at this and then say this is this is the uh, genome sequence that is going to convert into four digits of my eyes. So this is how my neck is made. Nobody can do it. Uh, and there is a uh, neural networks like AlphaFold is coming. Google AlphaFold. I think they won the Nobel Prize this time for chemistry. Uh, so what they do is uh, the the genome converting into uh, Protein sequence is easy, but how this protein, protein folds into uh, functional protein is the complex thing. So it, it, it does that. So we now are quickly trying to understand the world is becoming good at it, understanding how protein works. And then uh, computer vision is another thing very important. So this is a dog. So several years ago, if you show this to a computer, ask it to write this is the dog, and then if you show this, and then say, this is a dog, the computer has, can't identify anything uh, similar because all the pixels here is different to this. And even if you train it, uh, this, how can this be a dog? It's not possible to understand. And how can this not be a dog? The computer uh, so far uh, cannot do it. But we can do it. We can do it because we have a concept of dog inside us. So nowadays, uh, with neural interest, computers just can do that. So how we do it, we show a set of dogs and we have a data set and it says when the computer, the neural network can say whether it's a dog or whether it's not a dog. So you send a dog and it says yes a dog, no, it's not a dog. If it is wrong, we back for forgetting training. So when you continue to do it, what happens is within this neural network it develops a, what is called technically a lower dimensional representation of a dog. Or what we call a concept of the dog is to the inside. So advantage is now uh, many applications. For example, now this uh, autonomous driverless cars are coming. It is because uh, these cars now can see out and then recognize pedestrian crossings, uh, the rocks, and especially they can identify dogs. And uh, there's a uh, huge development in robotics happening uh, now due to artificial intelligence and uh, the ability to see because these machines now can think like us, see like us and also move like we do. Uh, for example, the Tesla is saying they are uh, warehouse workers, 10% will be replaced by this, uh, their robot by 2025. This is a scan of human retina and uh, a neural network looking at this can identify the diabetes level you have, the blood pressure you have, the kidney disease you have, the liver disease you have, the gallbladder disease and Alzheimer's disease. No human doctor can look at a scan of your retina and then say we have these things. So AI can see things far beyond the things you can see. Okay, those are some applications of neural networks, but there's something very important. Uh, can we run this backward? So can we input the height of their sun and not calculate these suns, but calculate 
the height of their father and mother. Can you do it? If uh, W1 and W3 is 0.5, 0.5, 1, 1 would do. But 0, 1, 0 and 2 will also work, isn't it? 0 height father, 2 height mother will work. But we know uh, just it's not probability. So based on probability, you can choose one solution and then say this is the most probable solution. So some modifications, we can run this neural network backwards. So that is what generative AI does. So these are the dogs you train it and it develops a concept of a dog. What happens when you run it backwards? There comes a dog from the other side. So that is what generative AI does. And the most important thing is to create this concept of dog. I don't necessarily have to train it with images of dogs. I can train it with poetry of dog. Then when you connect the other side paintings, poetry, it converts to painting. So that is how text to image uh, these conversions are done. So that is that is how transformers do it. Uh, and that is what generative AI is all about. So this uh, beautiful Indian lady, she doesn't exist. So it's an imagination of a neural network. This beautiful dress she's wearing, uh, no one has ever designed a dress like that. It's an imagination, it's a creation of artificial intelligence. And uh, can you recognize anything wrong with this image? Where AI has done any blunders? Exactly. <laughs> you look at fingers, you can see they are not human fingers, so the system has messed it up. Fine. Okay, so there is generative and transformers. So, poetry to painting, now we convert text to image, are there text to video, are there? And uh, nowadays, this is very popular among uh, engineers and artists 3D models. So, there are softwares that generate 3D models based on image and also text. And sketch to beam is not available yet, but I am sure it is on the way. Text to DNA is there, and text to protein is there. So all these conversions are now possible. And uh, as engineers and architects, uh, this is something important. This is the important thing. This is the core of my speech. Uh, when there is a free flow kind of thing like this, or any system, let's say it's a free flow. Can we send this to an internet network and then identify what is going to happen at the next moment? So let's say this is a building, this is a airflow, and how this airflow is going to be turbulent at the next moment. Can we do it? Yes, we can do it if we have a good huge number of data sets. So if you have data of this and then what is the result, we can ask the neural network to check this. Yes, it is correct or no, no it is not correct, and we can fail it. Uh, uh, the physicists have found that there is a better way of doing it now. And that is called PIMS Physics Informed Neural Networks. So, what happens is we put our data here, let's say the fluid flow here, and we get a result here. To check whether this is correct or not, to say whether this is correct or not, we need not to have a data set because this has to be physically accurate. Mass here has to be the same mass. Your mass is conserved. So we can't have different mass, and then we know if this is this answer is not correct. Momentum has to be conserved. And if this is an incompressible fluid, then uh, the divergence has to be true. And it should uh, then follow the radius of the equation and so forth. So PIMs are now getting popular and in many fields, it's coming uh, in, uh, in fluid dynamics, uh, the asynchronous analysis, the heat flows, and all those things. Now PIMs are playing a vital role. And uh, usually in PIMs, uh, what you input is x, y, z, code plus time. And what you get from in here is the velocities, u, v, w, velocity, and the pressure. And then you can check all these parameters after that. One of the things you can check is, look around here. Whether it satisfies the oil of gravity, that is also one important thing we can check now. And uh, nowadays, there's the second kind of uh, neural networks that is SYNDIS, that are very important. But SYNDIS does is this uh, you input a physical system here, let's say a video of apple falling. 
and Cindy's can study it and come up with the formula that governs. So what Newton did, now Cindy's can do just looking at a video. So you input, a, you input a physical system, data, positions and velocities and it comes up with the governing equation, set of equations. And these are real examples, so these are computer systems they have put so into Cindy's and these are the equations and with this uh, they have come from it works very well so this, the system is as good as human beings and then the last one look grand the neural networks so these are available now so what happens is you can uh, put to a neural network the positions and velocities of the system and it predicts the or it comes out with the look grand and that last one so that is the important thing uh, and uh, you remember the program we talked about this one, the standard model. This is not a simple thing, although it looks single, but it's a century of tireless works of many great minds of uh, the time, starting from Einstein to Niels Bohr uh, to Schrodinger to Heisenberg to uh, Peter Higgs to uh, Payaman to uh, and uh, thousand more, thousand more physicists. So this work that has been done for centuries with the involvement of the best mind of the world might happen in two years time in a fraction of a second. And we will be able to model and interpret complex systems like human brain, like climate, and we might be able to work with Lagrangians that are not like single pages but volumes of books or libraries kind of things we will be able to work with. And, uh, this is the message. For the last 200 years, the design technology is this world works on mathematical mathematical principles, and we can deal with it a fraction of it. We can deal with with differential equations. That's everything we know for the last 200 years. Although we have done such a massive amount of innovations and designs out of it, in near future, this is going to change. It's not we can deal with the fraction of it. We will be able to deal with almost all of it, no matter how complicated it is. So that day is coming very soon. And with that level of advanced design technology, it will trigger off an unprecedented revolution of design and innovation. So that is what is going to happen. And we will see an era of disruptive innovations and it is going to begin soon. So we, I think as Sri Lankans, we missed the first bus the last 200 years and it is better you get in here. You need not to know much calculations if you done in computers and uh, if you want to leave the world, here is the platform to do it. That's it. Thank you.